What's up, everybody? Welcome to System Crafters. I'm David Wilson, and today we're going to learn how to use encrypted passwords in Emacs. So if you've been watching the uh, the MU4E or the Emacs Mail series so far, you probably remember that we have sort of hand-waved over the whole problem of dealing with storing passwords to be used by MB Sync to sync your email. Uh, so today I want to try to address that so that we can actually come up with a strategy for dealing with encrypted passwords using Emacs so that we don't have to have a plain text file that has our password in it just sitting around on our file system. Uh, this became more important uh, when I started thinking about the episode that I want to do now where we start to, to send email. And uh, since sending email actually works a little bit differently because Emacs takes care of that for you, uh, Emacs has to have a way to get to the password as well. So now we're going to set up... Uh, a way to store encrypted passwords in Emacs and then use them both in Emacs and in external programs. So uh, if you've never heard of this before, there is a library called AuthSource in Emacs. And what it does is it provides a way to um, have various different uh, authentication sources or yeah, authentication sources, let's call it that. So basically these are different uh, backends for getting information about a username and a password for a particular service and they, sorry, I'm dealing with the, the audio level here. Uh, they, they can come from different places. So um, if you look at the auth sources variable that is a part of that library, and we're gonna use control H V to use describe variable and look that up. So auth sources, this is a variable that defines which sources are used for looking up passwords whenever you, you're trying to use the auth source library to do that. Uh, I also should say the auth source library is used by a variety, of different, a variety of different things in Emacs for looking up passwords. Like for instance, ERC, the uh, IRC client can use it whenever you don't specify a password directly. It can try to look up the password that you have stored for that particular IRC server or maybe even an IRC channel. Uh, also, the SMTP library in Emacs will look for the password for your SMTP server when you, when you try to send an email using the auth source library. So this is a pretty commonly used library for uh, storing passwords in Emacs so that they can be used for the packages that are built into Emacs and also for third party packages. So uh, the auth sources variable tells us that, uh, or at least in my configuration, which is not what you should be looking at right now, but the, the original value is that there is a file called authinfo.authinfo. There's also .authinfo.gpg, and then there's also a .netrc file. So uh, these are all text files that store password information in a very specific format, which we'll show in a minute. Um, but also the auth source library can interface with other keychains that are on Mac OS and Linux. Uh, for example, the Mac OS keychain, there is both an internet or generic keychain that the auth source has a backend to communicate with for the purpose of pulling passwords out of it. And also if you use Linux, there is the secret service, um, which is kind of a generic service in Linux for storing uh, passwords for various services. And uh, that can be used as well. But I believe the thing about the Linux secret service, if I'm not mistaken, is that these things don't persist or actually that's, that's kernel passwords. Anyway, Linux secret service, I think is a gen generic layer over the other possible key rings on Linux. So for example, the GNOME key ring or the K wallet or whatever it's called these days, I don't know if KDE has changed the name of their particular uh, key ring, but there are various programs for the larger desktop environments that have their own ability to store uh, passwords and GPG keys, etc. So um, the auth source library can also interface with those to pull keys out. However, uh, in my opinion, I think it's better to have control over where these passwords get stored. And whenever you're dealing with these other sort of bigger um, keychains, you don't really have as much visibility into what's being stored there. They can be pretty helpful, but for me personally, I don't really prefer to use them. So I, I like the, the sort of file-based approach, especially when you can encrypt the files, which is what we're going to show today. So if you want to try any of these other uh, backends after you see this video today, definitely try using the customized UI. We haven't really talked about that yet on this channel at any depth, but if you want to give it a shot, I, I highly recommend using that for customizing the auth sources variable because it's kind of complicated. They actually say that in the documentation for the variable that you should use the customized UI if you want to set any of these other sources. Now, what it does mean is that if you look at the uh, auth sources variable one more time, you can set it to be whatever file you want it to be so long as it 
uh, conforms to the format of the auth info file. I'm, I'm quite sure that's the case. All right, so let's move on to the next slide. So let's talk about the auth info file. So this is a file uh, that is a plain text file and is directly inspired by a type of file called .NET RC, which is very common in Unix systems dating way back. I don't even know when it began, but um, this is a plain text file that has a simple structure that says what the username and password is to connect to a given host. Uh, apparently it was used a lot for connecting to FTP servers and doing a cross machine file copying. And um, th this is something that I think Emacs had picked up and, and use, continue to use for this auth info file because it is pretty useful for storing passwords for particular services. So basically, if you look at this example, this is a line from an auth info file. The first thing you see is machine, because basically this, this says this line is relative to a given machine. Uh, and the machine is facebook.com, since we're pretending that we have a Facebook account. Uh, also, the login is Zuck. And the password is world domination with kind of like these hacker letters or whatever. So basically, this defines one account for the facebook.com server with a particular login and a particular password. And what the auth source library can do is read in this auth info file and uh, make, basically extract this information and then make it available to any, uh, any package inside of Emacs or just you can call the function yourself if you want to. So another interesting thing about this format is that you can store passwords for the same host, but with different ports or with different usernames, etc. So you can have multiple lines for the same host of mailprovider.com. Uh, they both have the same username, but maybe they have two different passwords for different parts of that domain. So for instance, if you were using 443 as like your secure uh, SMTP uh, port, maybe you have a different password. I don't know why it would be the case, but maybe you do. Let's say that. Uh, and then for the normal connecting to that domain, whenever the port really doesn't matter, then you have a different password that you can use. So uh, the auth source library is able to query for these different configurations for a particular domain or for any domain uh, using some query parameters that go to the, the function that you use for that. Uh, so this is really useful for whenever you want to store a lot of different passwords for, for different domains, but maybe for the same domain, you have different passwords for different users or for different ports, etc. cetera, uh, that, that gives you a lot of flexibility for con configuring that. So the auth source search function can read this file and then search for entries based on the details that we just discussed. So what I'm going to do is uh, jump over to my VM. I'm going to copy over these lines so we can try this out. So let me log in here. And then uh, I'm going to open up the dot auth info file, just plain text file. And then I'll copy in the other nice little password that we have here. So the VM that I'm using is an Ubuntu 2004 VM. And uh, we've been using this so far in a couple of different series for just showing a more traditional configuration because I use GNU Geeks as my distro. So it doesn't really give a good example of how to do this with a more um, mainstream distribution. So I'm using Ubuntu 2004 for this purpose. So um, now we've got these three lines inside of this file. And uh, what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and kill it using control XK just so that we don't have it open. You can see how it works. And uh, I'll switch to the scratch buffer since that gives us a place where we can copy some temporary Emacs Lisp code. And I'll copy these three lines over to it real, real fast. And then what we'll do is try to evaluate all of them. So uh, I'm going to run the auth source search on the host of facebook.com. Control X, Control E at the end of that line will evaluate it. And now you can see in the um, in the echo area, we get the result of the, evaluating that expression. And basically it is a, a list with the key value pairs of all of the information related to uh, that account. This is a P list. Uh, we'll talk about that in the Emacs list series in a bit. So you see that, that it has the host of facebook.com, the user and the secret, which looks like a bunch of garbage. But actually, I think this usually turns out to be a function that you can call to extract the actual password from that entry. Uh, so I think maybe it's just made it so that you don't have to have the plain text password password hanging around in memory. I could be wrong about that, but uh, that's just the way that the back end system works for the auth source library. So if I run uh, control X, control E at the end of the second line, uh, we're looking up for mail provider and user is mail user. Um, so interestingly, what we see here is that since we didn't specify the port, it actually gave us the first line, which is port 433. And I think that's because that's the order that that shows up in this file. If I run it at the end of this line as well, the third line, I believe it gives me back the same uh, information here because uh, the port was 433. However, 
there is a way to let's let's see if, if the order actually does matter i haven't actually tried this yet but it'll be interesting to find out so i'm going to switch the order of these lines so that the line with the port information is going to be the third line and um one thing i might need to do is clear the uh auth source cache let's see if this is a yeah okay so there is an interactive function called auth sort source forget all cache so when it loads this file in, it's going to actually cache it so let's just un let's just remove that cache I'll use Control X, Control E at the end of this line. And now I believe it got the one that didn't have the port. And I'll use Control X, Control E at the end of the third line that has the port. And I load that up. And um, I don't see the port information there. Let me look in the message buffer and see what I see here. Yeah, so it may just be that you need to be more specific. When you have a uh, multi uh, account situation for a given host, you may need to be a little bit more specific about your uh, details for each account just so that you don't get any. Uh, problems when you're looking at the password for a particular provider or a particular account on there. All right, so let's uh, move on to the next thing. Uh, I will say the one last thing. Um, to me, the benefit of using this .auth info file when it's encrypted, but not when it's unencrypted, is that you have more control over the file itself. Uh, it's not owned by some other program that you don't really have any visibility into very easily. I mean, obviously, you can look at the source of those, but uh, it's not very easy. Um, and then you can sync these files between systems somehow. Like if you have a sync thing or some other way to copy this file between systems, you could actually have it share between systems uh, if it's encrypted. That does require, though, that you have the same GPG keys on multiple machines. And we'll talk about that uh, probably in another episode, but something to keep in mind. I, I think it's just nice to be able to have a file that you have ownership of and can uh, manage yourself. All right, so let's talk about how we can encrypt this .auth info file because that's the whole point. We want to make sure that we can encrypt all of our passwords so they're not sitting plain text on our machine uh, and you know available for anybody who might have access to it or maybe if we just accidentally upload the file somewhere and all of our passwords are in plain text. So um, we are going to use the GNU PG program to um, create a, uh, an encryption key that we can use with the EPA library inside of Emacs. So EPA stands for the e Easy PGP Assistant. Uh, it's basically a library that interfaces with the GNU PG program to take care of uh, listing what keys you have access to, encrypting and decrypting files, etc. It can do a lot of things for you. Uh, of course, we don't have to actually use that directly. It sort of gets used implicitly by the things that we do inside of Emacs with the auth sources library. And also for editing, uh, basically any file that has a .gpg um, extension. So the idea is that if you have your encryption key set up correctly and you create a file with, with a .gpg extension at the end, Emacs will automatically try to encrypt that file. And then whenever you uh, try to reopen that file again, it will decrypt it automatically. So it's very transparent in how it handles the uh, encrypted files in your system. And that's how the authinfo.gpg file works. Uh, basically, you just have this, the same type of file with the same format, but instead of having it be .authinfo, you have .authinfo.gpg, and then that gets encrypted and decrypted whenever you try to read a password from it. So uh, let's go ahead and try to set up an encryption key so that we can um, start to use this functionality. Um, now we're going to use GPG, I think it's 2.2 point something. Uh, apparently in this version, they in introduced a new um, argument called full generate key, which actually is more of like a wizard that can help you create the basic kind of key that you need for most things. So we're going to use that. Uh, I've included some steps here, but I'm just going to show you how to do it. We're not going to walk through each of those uh, line by line in text. We're just going to run through the process. But these steps are here in case you need to refer to them later in the show notes. So we'll jump over to... Uh, our uh, shell here. I'm going to pull this up in eShell. Actually, no, let's pull that up in term mode just in case we run into any problems with the uh, with the wizard. So we're going to run GPG full generate key. And now it's going to give us a prompt or a few prompts actually to ask us about the keys that we want to generate. So first of all, it's going to ask us what kind of key we want. Uh, generally, you would just pick the RSA and RSA, the first default option there, unless you have very specific uh, requirements for what kind of key you want to use. For us, we're just trying to do encryption and decryption of files, so we'll just pick number one. Also, it says uh, RSA keys may be between 1024 and 4096 bits long. What size do you want? Um, generally, what you see people recommend online is to use 4096 because that's a lot harder for someone to uh, crack the encryption for a file that you have in case someone gets their hands on it. So it's better to just go ahead and use the 4096. And any, also, I'd like to say that if any of you watching this are security experts and I, I say something wrong here, please feel free to leave it in the comments. And uh, I'll be happy to correct the show notes afterwards just to make sure that everybody's on uh, the, the right course as far as security is concerned. 
Okay, so uh, also it asks you, uh, please specify how long the key should be valid. This one is kind of important uh, depending on how security conscious you are. Uh, the easiest option is just to say it doesn't expire because then it means you could just use the same key file for as long as you want. Uh, but always the more um, secure option is going to be have to, to have key expiration. But I don't personally know how to deal with key expiration when it comes to encrypted files. So also, if this is something that's a security ex expert watching this video knows, please let us know in the comments about uh, how you would deal with uh, ex ex key expiration and uh, updating the encryption of these files whenever you do expire the, the previous key. So for our case right now, we're just going to pick zero to keep the key from expiring ever. Um, and they're going to ask us to, to confirm that because they do know this is not necessarily the best thing to do security wise. So we're just going to say, yes, we do want to confirm that. All right. So now it wants to construct a user ID to identify your key. So we're going to, you just, you should type your name here because the next thing it's going to ask you for is your email address. Um, this is only used for identification of you. It's not used for, you know, sending this information anywhere. So, uh, I'm going to put in system crafters and then for email address, I'll put in system crafters dot test at gmail.com since that's one of the test accounts we're using and uh, in the comment field you can put any string here it could also be empty this is really just for you to be able to distinguish between the different keys that you've created because a lot of times you'll have multiple keys if you're working on different projects that need different keys for encryption etc or signing so um, in this in this field you can put uh, a comment if you want to I'm just going to leave leave it blank right now all right, so now it asks me, do I want to confirm this basically? Here's the information I've, I've added. Uh, do I want to change anything or am I okay with it? Well, I'm, I'm fine with this. This looks good. So I'm going to press the letter O and I'm going to press enter. So now it's going to ask me for a passphrase to set on this, uh, this key. And this is where the actual security of using a certificate comes in. Because, okay, sure, you have, uh, you have the encrypted file on your machine. But you also have to have the private key of the certificate or the or the encryption key on your machine to be able to encrypt or decrypt it. So how is that secure? Well, it's secure because anytime you want to use the encryption key, you have to unlock it with a passphrase. So uh, it's good to pick a passphrase that you're going to remember and that is sufficiently secure. So like, you know, a long enough password, maybe like 10 characters, and they're going to make sure that you try to use at least one digit in it so that it's not so easy to brute force crack. If you know anything about uh, password cracking. Basically, the idea is that if someone was sufficiently motivated and used a very simple password, they could potentially just use an algorithm to like try every possible password against your certificate and eventually break it. So make sure you pick something that is not uh, very easy to uh, to look up in a dictionary. I think it just timed out. Let's, tr let's try running this one more time. So um, yeah, so basically, you need a good password and it needs to be memorable, memorable for you. So let's just do this one more time. Sorry, I have to type this in again. Crafters. Okay, so I'm just going to type in a simple password. It's going to complain at me just so we can see what it looks like. Okay, so now it's going to give me a message saying I've entered an insecure passphrase. A passphrase should contain at least one digit or special character. I'm going to do the wrong thing, which is take this one anyway, because we're just going to go through this with simplicity. But you should probably take their advice and enter a better passphrase if it's necessary. So now the next thing it does, it tells you to move around your mouse and maybe press keys on the keyboard. Uh, because what it's doing is trying to generate a random number to use for your certificate. And the more randomness you get, the better quality it's going to be. So just try to move around your mouse a little bit whenever it runs through this part so that uh, you have a better result with the, uh, the certificate or the, um, the encryption key that gets generated. All right, so now we have a public and secret key created and signed. It gives you the information about that. And we can see that it is available if we run GPG dash dash list keys. It basically gives, it that, gives us that same information again. Um, also, uh, keep in mind that this, these files for the, the certificates are in your local .gnu PG folder. Uh, this has not only the private keys and public keys for your uh, certificates and your, your encryption keys, but it also has um, configuration for the GPG agent, which might be useful if you want to change the amount of time that your passphrase gets stored whenever you unlock your, um, your certificates or what your, you unlock your, your encryption keys in the future. Uh, so we might talk about that a little bit in a different episode, but for now, we're just going to leave everything configured as the default for the GPG agent. Um, so the reason why I want to bring this up is that it's probably good to have a backup 
of your uh, private keys or basically of this whole folder in a secure place so that if you ever need to change machines or if you lose it, you can still get to your encrypted passwords. This becomes more important the more you rely on having encrypted files for passwords. All right, let's see. What's next here? If you hear a crying child in the background, I apologize. So uh, let's see. So now we could try this out. So we've gotten a certificate or an encryption key created. We can try it out by editing the .authinfo.gpg file to see what happens. So what we're gonna do is create the .authinfo.gpg file. I'm just editing a new file like any other file. And I'm going to pull up the authinfo file that we have already created. I'm gonna copy these passwords. I'm gonna go drop them into authinfo.gpg. I'll go uh, close the original authinfo file. I'm gonna go back to the terminal and delete that file because I don't want it to be picked up automatically whenever um, auth sources uh, tries to look for a password. So let me remove the authinfo file. And now I'll switch back over to the authinfo GPG file. Now I'm gonna save this file. Nothing has happened until the point where I try to save it. So now I saved uh, the authinfo.gpg file. Now there's a window that pops up and it basically asks me what certificate I want to use to encrypt this file. So what you have to do in this view is move your cursor down to the line uh, for the certificate that you, uh, that you want to use for encryption. If you have multiple certificates on your system, you'll see multiple lines here. So you'll, you'll only want to uh, excuse me, select the line that uh, is for the, the certificate that you want to use for encryption. I, I, I keep saying certificate, it's probably the wrong word. I apologize for that, but the encryption key that you want to use. So I am going to hit M to mark this line as it tells me in the description here. Then I'm going to go put my keyboard cursor on OK and press enter. And now it has encrypted this file. So if I uh, kill this file, and then I go back to the file off info.gpg, it will ask me for the passphrase to decrypt the file. So we've encrypted it now. But now if we want to decrypt it, we have to unlock that uh, that encryption key so that it can be used to decrypt the file. So I'm going to put in the same passphrase that I used when I created the certificate or the encryption key. Uh, let's see. And now if I press enter, it pulls open the file. And uh, Enax makes this very sort of um, transparent to you. You don't realize that there's an encrypted file except for the fact that it's prompting you for it. But if you want to verify to make sure that this is actually uh, encrypted, we can just run cat in the shell, cat.authinfo.gpg. And you basically just see that it's a bunch of binary information. So this is actually an encrypted file. Emacs is just transparently handling it for us, which is great. Um, all right, so let's check the next step here. I think the next step is we're going to try to verify that we can load the um, the passwords that we have stored in this file. So we're going to use the same example that we had before in the scratch buffer. And first, I'm just going to run this auth source forget all cached first to make sure that we're not going to pull up anything that was cached already. And then we're going to switch back to scratch. And then I'm going to run control X control E at the end of this line for auth source search. And now <clears throat> you may have seen for just for a brief second at the bottom in the echo area that it was it decrypted that file. It wrote out a message that it was decrypting it. And now it wrote out the information about the account that I was looking up. Um, if this is the first time that you have used Emacs in your current session. Uh, it may prompt you for the passphrase at that point because it's trying to open that file first and then read the lines and then, you know, parse them to get the password information out. So. Um, occasionally that may happen again because the passphrase times out in the GNU PG program, basically so that if you log in once, it doesn't just stay active for your entire session. That way somebody who just walks up to your computer can't often just, you know, grab your password if they want to. So it's kind of a security feature. So just keep in mind that occasionally you will be reprompted for the passphrase, but that is actually intended to happen. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so um, the reason why all this has been working so far with um, the storing of the pass for the sorry the storing of the uh, encryption keys and the um, the passphrase prompting etc is because we were using the GPG agent. This is basically a program that runs in the background that uh, handles requests to um, load up certificates or encryption keys and also to encrypt and de decrypt files. Um, this is actually being managed right now for us by the EPA library. I believe that if GPG agent isn't running, the EPA library will automatically start it up or some, something in the system it causes it to start up. Since we're using uh, Ubuntu system, GPG agent is actually being run as a user level service. So it's already there and available. But if you 
are using a Linux distribution that, that doesn't set this up for you by default, like maybe uh, Arch Linux or uh, GNU Geeks, etc., uh, you're going to need to find a way to set it up yourself. So first of all, you can try to see if it's already running by using the pgrep command. So if we go into the terminal, uh, we can use uh, pgrep. And I'm going to use my username here with a dash u just to make sure we're only looking at my user account. Oh, let's see. Is it? It's just, oh no, David Will's my, my username here. And then I'm gonna look up uh, GPG agent. Uh, and it, it gives me a uh, process ID, which basically means there is a running GPG agent process. Uh, however, the, it may be the case that on your system, there isn't a running process. So if you need to start GPG agent, you can run this GPG connect agent slash buy command, and that will start up the GPG agent in the background. Um, and it, it will enable you to do all of this uh, working with the encryption keys that you have. Uh, if you have some way that you start up your system that is sort of non-standard, like you're not using a normal desktop environment, you may have to put this in your startup script somehow. All right. Um, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to mention here. All right. So um, now let's talk about one interesting aspect of this. So, so far, what this does is make it so that you can access passwords, these encrypted passwords inside of Emacs using the, uh, the auth source search function. Uh, so any built-in Emacs packages can get access to this. However, what if you want an external program to be able to use these passwords that you have encrypted in your auth source uh, or your auth info.gpg file? Um, well, by default, other programs don't know how to deal with this because this is a file that Emacs is basically managing for you and uh, they don't know how to read it. They also don't know the right way to decrypt it. So if you want Emacs to handle that for other programs, there is a way to do that. So uh, first of all, this does require that you run Emacs in as a daemon or in server mode. And I've got another video on that you can check out. There's a link here. I'll put the link in the description of the video as well. Uh, so that you can use the Emacs client program, which we discussed in that video, to invoke that auth source search command so that you can access those uh, passwords outside of Emacs. So while you have your e running Emacs session uh, loaded up, another program can call into Emacs to grab that password and do what it needs to do. So um, this is not necessarily straightforward. And to some people, this is going to seem a little bit nutty. Uh, but I'm just showing you that it's possible. In the next video I do on this sort of topic of uh, secure passwords, we're going to use a different program that simplifies this and makes a lot more sense. But at least for now, I'm just showing you that there's an Emacs only way to do this. So we're going to define this function. And uh, it's good to put this in your configuration so that it gets loaded up and is available for whenever another program tries to call into your running Emacs session. So what we're going to do is pop over to um, the config here. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to load up emacs.d and emacs.org. Um, I'm just going to put it in the Emacs, Emacs list block toward the bottom here. I'm not really going to think too much about it. If, you, uh, if you're not familiar with this uh, configuration file, definitely check out the um, Emacs from scratch series because this is where we set up this uh, literate configuration file in org mode. So um, we're defining a function called lookup password, EFS slash lookup password. And it takes as a, as a parameter <clears throat> A, a rest parameter, which basically says whatever you pass into this function, just give it to me as a variable. And we are going to um, pass that list into the auth source search function using the fun. Oh, actually, this is wrong. Uh, using the apply function. And what apply does is it basically says, give me the, the symbol for a function and give me the a list that has all the arguments to pass to that function and then just call it. So we're calling auth source search with whatever keys are being sent into this function for, uh, to the EFS lookup password function. And we're going to store the result for that. And if there is a result, uh, basically auth source search will return nil if it doesn't find anything based on the keys that you pass in, or it will return a an entry or actually a list of entries potentially. So um, if it's if it returns a result, we're going to get the the first item of the result. Uh, this is not going to make a whole lot of sense until we go through the Emacs list series whenever we get that done. But you get the first item of the result list and then you pull out the secret from that. <clears throat> so now that we've pulled out the secret, we want to call that function that is in the secret field of the password entry. And that's going to give us the password information back. So you don't don't worry too much if you don't understand what's happening here. Basically, what we're doing is just making it really easy to extract the password for a given uh, search query, I guess, and then return it back as a string. So I'm just going to evaluate this code really fast. And now we can test this out um, by running Emacs client in the shell. So let me pull this line over to the terminal. And uh, hopefully it, it 
it uh, copies correctly. I think it's not actually copying correctly. I'm gonna just drop this in the scratch buffer real fast to make it easier to handle. Okay. So I'll copy that line, go back to the terminal, and then I'll try to run it again. All right, so <clears throat> Emacs client is telling me it can't find the socket, and that's because I did not run server start yet. So let's run server start. I'm gonna hit uh, Alt X, Meta X, run server start. And now Emacs is running in server mode. So if I call this Emacs client dash E line, it will give me the world domination pass, uh, password that because we're looking up the host of facebook.com and the user of Zuck. So let's break down what's actually happening here. So we are calling Emacs client dash E to evaluate a line of Emacs Lisp code. We're calling our EFS lookup password function. We're passing in the same kind of search parameters we would give to auth source search, the host of facebook.com and the user of Zuck. And then whenever the result of Emacs client comes back, we will uh, use the cut command, which is something that comes with the GNU tools to basically take the uh, quotation marks off of the sides. And now let's see what happens whenever we run this without that cut command at the end. <clears throat> so I'm gonna take off the cut command entirely and I'm gonna run this line. So it's gonna bring back world domination, but it's gonna have uh, uh, quotation marks around it. And that's because the string rep representation of a string in Emacs Lisp has quotation marks. So that's what, <clears throat> excuse me, that's what the result of the evaluation of this function is. And that's what it's gonna print out. So we need to do an extra step to take those quotation marks off before we use that password. Otherwise, it's going to be a wrong password. OK, so now um, basically any program can call this line to get the password for that account out of Emacs. Uh, and what we're going to do is prove that this works by using the MB sync config that we uh, set up for the Emacs mail series and uh, pull up the password from Emacs for uh, the systemcrafters.test Gmail account. So I, what I'm going to do is uh, edit this file, the, the authinfo.gpg file. I'm going to add a new line to it. I'm going to hide my screen really fast so that you don't see the password I'm putting in. Don't worry, I, if I happen to expose it somehow, I'm, uh, I'm using a app password that I can revoke. So let me just go back to my webcam real fast, and you can take a look at my face while I do this. So let's see. Auth info example, I'm going to copy this line, paste it in real fast, and I'll kill both of these buffers. Okay, and now I'm going to go over to the MB sync file. I can go back to my screen, I think now. All right, so I'll go back to the MB sync.rc. <clears throat> and what I'm going to do is copy this pass command line over. So I'm going to copy this line, and then I'll tell you what it's doing. So now I'm replacing the previous line that we had that was just basically uh, catting the uh, a, a plain text file to get the password. And now we're going to replace it with this EFS lookup password call through Emacs client. Now, keep in mind that because pass command wraps the command in quotation marks, you're going to have to do some escaping of the quotation marks that are inside of it, which does lead you to have to do some double escaping of a slash that goes in front of the uh, the quotation marks that are inside of the the quotation marks. It gets a little bit nutty here, but just uh, try to follow the example I'm using here and uh, hopefully it will work. Uh, I will say I have not actually tried this yet, so we're both going to find out really quickly whether this works or not. So uh, let's go back to the terminal and see if we can uh, run MB sync now to sync our mail. So good sign. Uh, I ran MB sync A. It asked me for the passphrase to decrypt the passwords. So, so let's run, let's put in the, the uh, passphrase for that. And now it seems to be syncing our mail. So basically what happened is that uh, the, the MBSync program invoked Emacs client to call the function that we defined to look up the password for the Gmail account. And then it was able to use that password to continue executing and syncing our email. So now we do have a fully encrypted password on our local machine that we don't have to worry about anymore because uh, we are not just leaving it plain text anymore. All right, so I'm glad that worked. <laughs> Um, so I just, just one more thing to mention about the slashes. So, um, the reason why we're having to do these slashes is when you have a first opening parenthesis, uh, for a string, usually when you're passing it in somewhere, like in a program or, or in some code somewhere, um, the, the inner, inner quotation marks, if you don't use a slash in front of the quotation mark, it will end the string and it will cause syntax problems in whatever you're editing. So we use a single slash to say, okay, this is not actually a quotation mark. This is something that is a part of the string. 
However, when we get into a third level of quotation marks, so we've got the first level at the beginning of the pass command line, then we have a second one here for invoking Emacs client, but then when we invoke the function inside of the invocation of Emacs client, we have another quotation mark. So not only did we have to do the one slash in front of the quotation mark, we have to use a second slash to say that this is we're slashing the quotation mark for real, but then we have to do a third slash to slash the slash to, to escape the slash basically so that the result is that you have a slash quotation mark in the inner string. So this is kind of um, hard to wrap your head around sometimes, but um, if you have any trouble with this, definitely uh, leave a comment in the video or find me on the Discord, the link's in the description, and we can talk about it. Um, I hope this is not too much of a problem for people. Uh, in the next video that we do on passwords, it'll be a lot easier because we're gonna use a program that makes it so that you don't have to, uh, to deal with this kind of slashing everywhere. So uh, on that note, the next video that we're gonna do uh, around passwords is to use a program called pass which is a very cool program that handles a lot of this encryption and decryption of password files for you but it does it in individual files for each account so that uh you can actually manage it uh a little bit more sensibly and also you can easily sync those files to a git repository somewhere so that you can have them in sync between multiple machines um, i use this and i find it to be pretty cool there's also uh, mobile apps and browser extensions you can use that will pull the information from pass so you can have a full free software self-managed uh, password system so you don't have to use something like LastPass or one pass or whatever and it's something that is very simple to use uh, and uses all you know GNU tools basically or, or free software tools. So I think it's a pretty cool thing to to use. So we're gonna go into more detail about that in a future video. Uh, but really, the whole point of doing this today was to make sure that when we go into talking about sending mail with SMTP and Emacs, we have a, the ability to have an encrypted password to load into that, so that we're not just putting plain text passwords into our Emacs configuration. All right. So uh, hopefully that was useful for you today. Definitely let me know in the comments if you. Uh, if you liked it or if you have any other ideas or questions about it. So before we go here, I just want to take one moment to thank, <clears throat> excuse me, thank my sponsors. Um, these people have found it, um, uh, found, I guess, what I do here uh, valuable enough to decide to sponsor me. And I, I'm so thankful for the, the people who have done this. Uh, it gives me a lot of inspiration and drive to continue making these videos. And I don't know, it just makes me feel like uh, people care about what, what, what I'm doing here. So it's, it's really great. I, I really appreciate it. And if you are interested in sponsoring what I'm doing here with these videos, please uh, check out the two links in the description below. I'm on both GitHub sponsors and Patreon. So uh, whatever you like to, to do there is great. Also, I have a link to PayPal in case you want to do a one-time donation. So uh, until next time, uh, I think the next video that we'll do in this series is going to be back to, to mail again. So maybe we'll talk about past, you know, in a week or two or something like that. And uh, until then, uh, hopefully this was great for you. And uh, we let's let's chat about it on the discord and we'll, we'll see what happens uh, whenever you try to use it. I hope hopefully it works for all of you. Anyway, uh, until next time, happy hacking. Thanks a lot for watching.